The main character here, Jessica, is a nine-year-old girl kept captive for research because she's the last person on Earth to carry genetic markers for psychopathy. She's a gifted artist, something she has inherited from her mother, who committed suicide and was and has schizophrenia. The psychiatrist, Charlie, sees her as an object, the psychopath, just a whole, just a part of his research. And here his wife admires a portrait that Jess has done of the nurse, Tom. Just like a normal person, she says, reminded of her humanity, that she is a person and not an object, only to be repulsed by it when she is, it's revealed that it was painted using bristles from her hairbrush and blood from her finger. Through art, it becomes very evident that the way we tangibly represent what goes on in our minds and the way that rep rep representation can be perceived can be very different from others. Therefore, I believe that art itself is a prominent reminder of humanity, the individual quality of each and every person. It reminds us of our innate desire to express. It represents the diversity of thought and creative energy that exists in mankind of the unique qualities of the individual a pertinent anchor in compassionate medical practice. Art done by mentally ill patients inside and outside of institutions has been referred to with many, many terms. And one of them, outsider art, refers to art that has been done outside of the mainstream art world by artists who have had no formal art training. Art of this kind is seen to be idiosyncratic, individualistic and expressive, and also implies a kind of innate automatic and unconscious nature to it, which I feel detracts from the agency of the artist to want to consciously express their ideas. Um, for my SSC presentation, I set out to find if any common themes in art, if there were any common themes and qualities in art done by patients um, with mental illnesses. And for this purpose, I looked at um, the art therapy studio of the Beth Memorial Hospital, the oldest, survival, the oldest, oldest surviving mental institution in the world. For those of you who don't know, um, the word Bedlam comes from this very hospital itself. Bedlam itself was the first mental institution of its time. And back then, it was the epitome of chaos and madness. Because the people who set out to help them had no idea what to do. And how much mental health care has grown over the years. I tried to explore art therapy and I found that what art therapy can do is to harness the creativity and spontaneity in artistic endeavours and use art as a medium for communication and understanding. It's not a one-way psychoanalytical tool as many people may believe. You can't simply look at a piece of art and say red represents anger or seven brush strokes represent frustration, but all these things you realise represent different things, they mean different things to each individual. With that, I think to realize the futility of my search and the myopic view that I came in with. How can you reduce creativity and compare it to symptoms of a mental illness? What I found was a diverse, but diversity of styles and subjects. Their artwork stands alone and the individuality shines through. Although their conditions and stories lend context to the art, it's given me a new perspective on not just seeing patients through the lens of their conditions. Which leads on to the next point, art, and the process of making art can be immensely cathartic, calming, and expressive for the individual. I'm going to move on to some artist profiles, which I've gotten from the online gallery of the Bethlehem. So Stephanie Bates is an artist who's lived with OCD for all her life. If you look at these illustrations, they personally remind me of Quentin Blake, um, who illustrated Rota. And uh, I brought up Stephanie Bates as a really good example of how um, her art kind of defines the perceptions we have of artists with OCD. People expect, people who are showing this to expect of, uh, artists with OCD to produce really detailed works, frustrations, minuscule details, but no, look, this is free, black hearted, colorful, bright, changing perspectives. Um, so, Stephanie. Uh, shared in a video interview how art was a form of coping ever since she was a child. She was encouraged to draw when, by her father whenever she was upset, and she described it as a way of jumping shit. And I find this choice of words very, very interesting because treatment for OCD focuses on something called exposure and response prevention. It means helping a patient face their fears and let these obsessive thoughts occur 
without trying to neutralize them with compulsion, such as ritualistic behavior, touching the table 10 times, opening the door up 10 times, things like that. Hence, I feel Stephanie's idea of jumping shit is just that. The shit is going down, but she will be going down again. Dan Guardian is another artist in the bathroom, and his work consists of long gone faces in black and white. And um, Dan, was first, oops, um, Dan was first admitted to the bathroom uh, for anorexia with Mosa, and he was detained under the mental health act three times. He described his art as a kind of cipher for self expression, expressing the extreme feelings of self hate and um, desire for self harm that he felt while in the worst state of his mental condition. He first encountered art at the Bethlehem Hospital, and uh, I met Dan at a conference where he debated for the use of art in the NHS. In his own words, he said, I have drawn comfort from the simple act of drawing. And I feel that through art, if all had some sort of form, some sort of catharsis, some form of release, and they've been able to express so much that may have not come out as powerfully or even at all. And this work has opened the lived experience to be shared with others and invites us to have some insight into their lives such that we might find some new level of understanding. Through art, many patients have found a newfound purpose, a newfound identity as an artist in art advocacy and destigmatization. Which moves on to my last point, art for society. Art itself is a powerful vehicle for normalizing what may be taboo. Artists are communicators. Through their art, they can communicate compelling reasons to rethink our perception of things. Liz Atkins is an artist who works with her body. She's lived with compulsive skin thinking for the whole of her life, and for her, it was a way of releasing tension, blocking out emotion, and calming herself down, but gave her, in turn, a lot of guilt and shame. She only properly addressed it when she was about 30 years old, seeking medical treatment and facing it through dance and drama. Her body is a canvas, and she plays with textures, clay, latex, acrylic, applying layers of it to her skin and feeling it off, creating somewhat graphic and probably shocking um, photographic portraits. One of my classmates pointed out, wouldn't this even this wouldn't this be even more shocking and perhaps more sympathizing? And I thought perhaps this it is exactly this kind of shock factor that is needed that creates the opportunity for discussion and discourse and paired with the well informed future, we can lead to new things. Liz herself is an active advocate for destigmatizing CSP and other anxiety disorders. She has exhibited her art internationally, carrying a gallery shows with engagement sessions where she speaks about her lived experience, encourages fellow sufferers to speak up and seek treatment. I believe that the boundaries of medicine lie not just in science, but in the humanities and the study of the human condition. Medicine never operates alone, not outside of the context of the world, society, policy, politics, journey on. Um, and conflict. And it is from this intersection between disciplines which are rarely brought together when new ideas and insights spring forth. Surely art isn't the solution. It's not as simple as that. That's why we have medicine. But it should always, I believe, remain an option, an opportunity for us, doctor and patient, that amongst the toolkit of drugs and procedures we have, we should also remember the value of the subjective experience, the abstract, the less well-defined, for medicine as well. <coughs> we may never get rid of uncertainty, but we just get more comfortable dealing with it. In the basement of the church of St. George the Martyr in Barra, a community meets every Monday afternoon. They're called the Dragon Cafe, and they call themselves the Mental Health Fight Club. A table generously laden with art supplies to raise its patrons. One of the walls is adorned with butterflies, painted by the patrons, and one of them is accompanied by this beautiful quote. Art nourishes the sick mind by giving it a cell of its own.